We are very happy to have you here to know more about COVID-19. But first, we would like to invite our Honourable Vice-Chancellor of International Medical University, Professor Abdul Aziz bin Baba, to give his opening remarks. Let us give a hand to Professor Aziz. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. Very good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for all of, for your, of you being here today. Uh, I see many visitors from outside IMU. For, for those who are here for the first time, welcome to IMU and thank you very much for coming to this very important public forum. I think as all of us are aware, towards the end of last year, an outbreak of a mysterious illness occurred somewhere in China, to be specific, in the province of Hubei. Of course, we now know that this illness is now is due to coronavirus and as of the 11th of uh, this month, the WHO has proposed a new name for this disease, COVID-19, which is an acronym for Coronavirus uh, Disease 2019. Uh, whilst the majority of the cases, I think at the last count, the last time I checked two days ago was more than 40,000 worldwide, whilst the majority of the cases are still within China, because as we know, because of the way the virus is transmitted from human to human, and the ease with which international travel is now possible, the spread of the COVID-19 is beyond China. Uh, I think, what, 24 plus countries, right? And Malaysia has not been spared. Uh, in China, as, I, as we read the daily updates, the number of cases continue to increase. And uh, I think there's also a large pool of undetected uh, or unscreened uh, patients. So I think we can all agree that the situation is very dynamic and rapidly evolving. For Malaysia, I, I think we can be thankful that the uh, measures taken by our health authorities have been very appropriate and timely. And, but as for you and me, I think it's important that we continue to adhere to the advice given by the authorities in terms of minimizing exposure and the risk of getting uh, the condition by adopting good personal hygiene measures, as well as also availing ourselves to accurate, clear information which is given in a timely manner. I think like any other crisis situation, uh, disasters in the past, there's been a lot of misinformation, not just by social media, but also by mainstream media. So I think the object Objective of this public forum is to provide timely, factual, and obviously accurate insights into what this epidemic is all about, what measures have been taken by our regulators, and what we need to do as individuals and as a community. So I think I'm very grateful that we've managed to uh, gather for you three experts in your own field. We have our own uh, Professor James. Uh, who is an ID infectious disease expert from the School of Medicine. And we have the Deputy Director of the Infectious Disease Division of the Ministry, Dr. Kabir. Thank you very much for sparing your evening to be with us and to share your insight and what the Ministry is doing uh, to the IMU community as well as to the general public. And then also we have Professor Dato Lohman, who is no stranger to managing uh, crises because as the Deputy Director of the Ministry of Health, he was very much involved with managing uh, epidemics such as uh, SARS and MERS and, you know, uh, conditions like that. So he's, he's going to talk about, uh, you know, uh, coronavirus in the context of what's happened in the past and how we can learn from the, uh, the actions taken by Malaysia. Okay, with that short uh, uh, words, I hand over to, okay, I forgot to obviously thank the Community Engagement Office, uh, Professor Toh Chugit and Professor Swan Pek. Thank you very much for this initiative. Uh, I should have mentioned that first, but you know, better mention at all, right? Okay, thank you very much, and we hope, I'm sure we can get a very enlightening and informative session this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Aziz Baba, for the wonderful remarks. Now, to begin this forum session, I would like to invite Professor Ku Swanpei and the, the, the panelists to take their seats forward. Uh, 
Uh, good evening, everybody, uh, to the eminent Vice Chancellor, Prof. Aziz Baba, uh, the IMU Senior Management, esteemed forum panelists. It really wasn't easy to actually get everybody together today, including yourself. Uh, our neighboring community, um, may I know how many of you are here outside from outside IMU? It's quite a number. Okay, so a good evening to all of you, and if this is your first time here in IMU, we bid you a warm welcome. I am uh, the Associate Dean for University Community Engagement, uh, dentist by day, <laughs> and uh, I will be moderating this session. So, um, as you heard from Prof. Aziz uh, earlier, that we're gathered here today because of the uh, response and concerns about this mysterious uh, respiratory illness. So, um, we've gathered today, uh, the one of the best in our country, the experts in the university uh, today, all together to be able to uh, field your questions, clarify your doubts, give us guidance, so that we will be able to help ourselves, help others, and together we are fighting this, as the WHO uh, DG says, the public enemy number one. So, I'm going to introduce uh, the panelists here. Um, we'll start with Professor Dr. Lukman on my left. Uh, he is the IMU, he is IMU's Pro Vice Chancellor of Research. He is the former Deputy Director General of Public Health, Kementerian uh, Kesehatan, from 2011-2017. Dato also serves, very importantly, on the WHO Framework Advisory Group for Pandemic Influenza Preparedness. Dato will be sharing his insights and perspectives from Malaysia as well as WHO based on his rich experiences having served on these roles mentioned. Then we have Dr. Kabir Vera Sahib is presently the Deputy Director for Infectious Diseases, Disease Control Division, uh, also Ministry of Health. Dr. Kabir will bring us to ground zero in Malaysia. So with his insights on what the government is doing, he is directly involved in managing this outbreak here in Malaysia for us, protecting us. And we will be receiving first-hand info on what's on the ground. And you can ask away whatever you want to ask uh, during the Q&A. Then on my right, we have uh, Professor James Ko Kui Choi. He is a consultant, infectious diseases specialist and professor in oral medicine, IMU. He is also associate dean for quality research and postgraduate studies. Prof. James Ko will share the clinical perspectives of COVID-19. Who better than the clinical expert himself? So, uh, without much ado, let's give them a hand. Thank you. So, uh, this is how we're going to do it. For the next uh, 20 minutes or so, we are going to have each of the speaker uh, give their insights in their own areas. As I mentioned earlier, about 7 minutes to 10. Then we will open this out to Q&A. Okay? So when we come to Q&A, you have uh, uh, an opportunity to ask questions and we have mics running around to you. And also, you can type in your questions and we will read it out. Uh, you can remain anonymous. Okay? So let's welcome the speaker. We'll start off with um, Prof. James Cole first. Thank you. Okay, good, good evening everyone. I think I have six minutes left. Uh, okay. Um, actually, Prof. Aziz has, uh, has used up half of my slides, uh, so, so it will be very fast. I'm just going to bring you through the, the, the outbreak. Um, this is my disclosure. Um, I, I have been an uh, infectious disease uh, specialist for about uh, no experience in 20 years, but uh, in terms of actually managing infections about 13 years. Uh, um, I have personal experience with SARS. That time I was a medical officer. I have little experience in mers cov because by the time I come back, um, I don't have to be frontline anymore, <laughs> thank God. So, um, and I have very limited experience with uh, the current one. Although in my hospital, in Suramban Hospital, we do have two uh, confirmed cases. Right? So that's my disclosure. Um, I'm just going to bring you very quickly through the timeline. So uh, last year, in the beginning of December, um, uh, a doctor uh, raised concern about uh, um, unusual pneumonia. 
And by the end of December, uh, WHO was notified by China that there is a new disease. Right? Um, within a day, uh, the seafood market in Wuhan uh, was closed, but uh, now there are some dispute whether that was actually the epicenter of the whole thing. Um, six days later, they identified the virus, which is very, very fast considering um, the, the, <coughs> the disease compared to others. And uh, another four days, the first death was uh, uh, announced by China. In January, a lot of things happened. Uh, first case outside China in Thailand, then Japan, uh, Singapore, uh, Wuhan was locked down on January 23rd, and January 27th, uh, Malaysia, uh, <coughs> we also want to be Malaysia Boleh. We also got our first case, right? And uh, by the end of January, uh, WHO initially was saying that it's not quite a global uh, emergency, but the end of January, yes, they said yes, it's a global emergency. And, um, well, the good news is uh, on February 4th, uh, we have our first case, we recovered in Langkawi, if you have been following the news. And then two days later, uh, before that we were saying there's no local transmission, no local transmission. Then two days later, bam, then we have our first local transmission, right? And um, the news, um, just an hour ago, we have 19 cases in Malaysia, right? Um, most of them are Chinese national. Um, <laughs> two of them are in my hospital, uh, father and son. They are the ones who were evacuated from Wuhan and come back. Uh, they are asymptomatic, meaning they have no symptoms whatsoever. They're, poop. they're very bored in the isolation room, but we have to keep them there, <coughs> right? So from an uh, outbreak, it became an epidemic. So if you are planning a holiday, this will be good places to go, right? <laughs> Africa and South America. And this morning, when I checked, uh, we have 60,000 cases uh, 1,235 deaths. And, but the, the, the good thing, I just checked like two seconds ago and we have reached uh, more than 6,000, right? So the ratio of people who are recovering compared to death is very unfortunate even if one person died, but the rate is climbing and, you know, people are recovering from the disease, right? Mortality rate still uh, comes up to about just 2%, right? So a very quick uh, description of the virus looks like the sun's uh, hello, uh, corona. There are some human coronaviruses which has been circulating for the longest time. And we only started looking for them after SARS, uh, 2003. And then we found all these uh, viruses. And these are zoonotic. Zoonotic means they jump from animal to human. Now, so these are all the viruses. And in fact, the human coronaviruses, in fact, have their origin from bats and rats, uh, as, as with uh, SARS and mers -CoV, uh, But this is a civet cat. Uh, they have an intermediate host, so, so the virus jumps from bats to an intermediate host before it jumps to human being. So for this disease, um, this little cute animal, uh, pangolin, might be the intermediate host. So far, the evidence seems to point to that. Right? So comparing with other diseases, how deadly is this current disease? Uh? Um, well, SARS here, fatality rate 10%, mers um 35%. And Ebola uh, is uh, much, much higher here. I can't really see. My, I'm getting old. Anyway, but if compared to this one, uh, COVID, uh, it's just about 2%. Right? So I just want to allay fears. Uh, the mortality rate is very low. Right? Um, you're going to say, what if I'm one of that 2%? Uh? So we're going to talk about that now. Uh, compare this to uh, influenza. This is the estimate from CDC. The last four, in just four months, uh, in US, uh, we have 10,000 deaths, 180,000 hospitalizations, 8.6 million medical visits, 19 million illnesses, uh, but nobody is calling for us to not go to the US, so it looks okay. Uh, right, so this virus has uh, transmitted, and we have had experience with MERS and uh, SARS, and they're all coronaviruses, so, so we sort of expect them to behave the same way. Uh, so transmission would be quite the same as well, huh? uh, coughing, sneezing, uh, touching something that has been contaminated, um, shaking someone's hands, uh, uh, you can, la, uh, but you need to know who you want to shake hands with. Personally, I don't like to shake hands, but sometimes you have to. Right? Uh, and of course, fecal contamination. But if you look at this, the three of, out of these four, uh, you can mitigate by just washing your hands. Right? So if you can't remember anything today, just go back and wash your hands again and again and again. Right? So. 
So um, incubation period means how long from exposure do you get your first symptom, right? Initially, it was thought to be about 10 to 14 days. Now, uh, there are some evidence to suggest it's more than 14 days. Uh, we're not very sure. But the evidence are not that strong yet, so there are some experts who say it's probably about 24 days. The symptoms would be just like any other coronaviruses. Uh, um, fever, runny, road, uh, runny nose, um, sore throat, and shortness of breath. Uh, complications would be mainly in the lungs and the kidney. So kidney failure and a pneumonia. How do I protect myself? Um, I think everybody has seen these kind of things. I think this is out of stock, huh? wear masks. Uh, soap is still available, huh? water also. So we can wash our hands. Huh? Uh, don't eat sushi, although I'm going for sushi later, but don't eat sushi, just listen to me, just don't do what I do. Right? Uh, observe good personal hygiene, cough into tissue. These are all still in stock. Huh? We can buy tissue, right? fish and all, cook them and consult a doctor if you're not well, and avoid uh, large crowds. La. This one consider moderate crowd, la, not that large, la, so you can still be around here. Uh, this is the way to wear the mask. La. The color is always outside. Uh, I get very annoyed you know, when people wear it inside. I don't know why. It's like wearing your underwear the other way around. It's like, uh, wear the mask with the color outside. Right? The metal part is here. Uh, just press it down. Uh. Okay. For me, not much to press. La. Chinese like that. Not much to press. You press it down, huh? loop it behind. Some come with strings, you tie it at the back. And don't keep touching it. Huh? It is not like, oh, is it still there? Is it still there? It will always be there. Huh? Just don't touch it. Huh? And don't touch your face as well. Huh? And if it's soiled, huh? then uh, quickly throw it away and wash your hands. That's all. So who needs to wear a mask when you are unwell? Because the mask protects others from you. Huh? You are the dangerous one. Huh? It doesn't protect you from others. Huh? So when, if you're unwell, wear a mask. So you must be unwell. Right? Kidding. <laughs> but it's also quite fashionable huh? nowadays. You can wear. Very nice. <laughs> okay. So in, this is the latest guideline from our government. Who are the people who will be suspect? And what do you mean by close contact? Huh? When we say suspect, means a uh, person under investigation. Chinese say pui, huh? like uh, spitting. Huh? P U I. Huh? If you have fever or you have all these symptoms, remember with or without fever. Some people have no fever at all. But you must have traveled to China, right? So far, the government still say China. Lah. You know, other countries are still, there are some rising cases. But so far, uh, the government directive is China within 14 days or close contact with someone who is confirmed. Huh? Confirmed means with laboratory confirmation. So, who are these close contact people? Um, healthcare providers who have treated confirmed patients uh, or work with healthcare providers who are uh, themselves infected. If you look, look, read the news, there are about 500 Chinese doctors or nurses who have the coronavirus just because they are treating patients with coronavirus. They are in the front line. Um, working together in a close proximity, sharing the same classroom. Uh, uh, if you have one here, it's a hall, but if you have a classroom, then that would consider a close proximity. Right? Traveling together, right? Um, maybe in a, 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 a plane, uh, but transiting is not counted. Uh, transiting. Uh, you go there, touch and go, not counted. Uh, you must be in the same plane for a while. Uh, uh, living in the same uh, household. So if you feel that you are symptomatic, uh, you can go to any of these hospitals. 26 of them in Malaysia has been identified. Uh, and if you just Google, there'll be a hotline as well. You can call up and you can get yourself tested. When do we admit you? Right? Um, if you are clinically ill, right? uh, if you have some comorbids, uh, like uh, elderly or very young, uh, pregnant women, those who uh, have no transport, you know, uh, those who are close contact of confirmed cases or laboratory confirmed cases regardless of symptoms, we will admit all these people. Just like we admitted the two person from Wuhan who are evacuated, they actually have no symptoms whatsoever. But the labs from the specimen say it's positive. So we have to admit them even though they have no symptoms. Right? And we discharge them when there are two samples. No fever, two samples, uh, negative. This one I created, uh, so I should patent it myself. This is a starter pack, uh, uh, starter pack for COVID, uh, how to survive COVID. One, uh, don't spread fake news. Uh, this is the worst thing ever. You know, there are people telling me, you know, it's very similar to a 
you know, it's actually a bio warfare, lah, you know, uh, very similar and all that. So a lot of things I, I keep hearing, you know. Uh, so we can do our part by verifying what we hear and uh, don't spread the false, uh, fake news because it will cause panic, right? We don't want people to panic. Uh, wear a mask, huh? uh, I can sell you. No, I'm kidding. I even can't buy also. But you can buy soap, huh? wash hands. And most importantly, you have to keep calm. That's the most important thing. Right? Uh, I'll be happy to answer the questions later. Good, ten minutes. That was really wonderful and informative, Prof. James Cole. So we'll now move to Dr. Vera, uh, Dr. Kabir. Sorry, do you want to be there or here? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, on behalf of Ministry of Health, I would like to thank the organizer, especially Dr. Dr. Lokman, for giving us the opportunity to be part of this very important uh, forum uh, this uh, evening. Sir. I will start with uh, a little bit of analysis, not, not uh, what we call a brief analysis of situ current situations of uh, COVID-19 in Malaysia. I think for the world, you can, you can Google uh, the, the figures in China and what. Okay, currently, uh, we have 19 laboratory confirmed uh, COVID-19. Out of that, out of that nine, 17 we consider as imported. You can ask me what you mean by imported. Imported cases. And uh, we have two about the local transmission, but we can trace the, this cluster, these two cases, to the imported one. So in other words, there's no, what they call it, uh, sporadic or community infection currently in Malaysia. What I mean is sporadic is not unlinked. You cannot link to any cases. What happened in Singapore? They have already a few cases that unlinked or sporadic means that they already have community uh, transmission going on. Okay, if you look at the 19 cases just now, it's from our testing due to the suspected. We call it person under investigation, PUI. Eight of, out of uh, 19 just now. And nine from our effort, we do the contact tracing. I will explain contact tracing. Nine of cases that we uncovered from our effort. We do the contact tracing, we tested, and it turned out to be positive. Of course, two from Ibaqui special mission from Wuhan, which is under quarantine. That one I won't touch because very simple. They come, we test, and then we lock them up for 14 days. Until they are cleared, then we let, let them go. Before they are, they are let go, we will test them again. That, I think, less of worries to the Ministry of Health. Okay, uh, out of uh, 19 cases, 13 are Chinese national. Chinese, not Malaysian Chinese, Chinese national. And six are Malaysian. Out of six Malaysian, four are uh, coming back to Malaysia, either from China, from Macau. I mean, Macau, but have been to mainland China. On one is from Singapore, which have, have connected with... Uh, uh, Sebobo, uh, what they call it, Grand Hyatt Hotel in Singapore, where they have a uh, few cases, uh, two, one in Malaysia, one in Singapore, one in Hong Kong, and uh, one in UK that becomes super spreader, spread to Germany and uh, UK. That we can trace that link. Okay, uh, and then uh, six Malaysian just now I said, four are, I, we will consider, Ministry of Health consider important because we can trace where they come, uh, the case come from. And two are Mal uh, Malaysian, which are related to the imported one. So, as it is now, I mentioned just now, uh, uh, there's no, uh, what I call it, local, uh, local transmission due to the sporadic cases. And we are very grateful to God that up to now, there's no healthcare worker being infected. As compared, I, we don't want to take, talk bad about others, but the situation is different. 
they are very cramped hospital, things like that. So they got, I mean, unfortunately, even doctors died. But in Malaysia so far, we maintain strict IPC and we monitor them, those who are managing the case. So far, we are lucky. No healthcare staff are uh, what call it, infected by the COVID-19. Okay. Okay, the mission, uh, we have second mission, third mission, that I think I won't, I won't touch on the missions. Uh, okay, I would like to say this, Malaysia is still in early containment phase. What does it mean? It means that suspected cases, close contact, all will be tested. And they will be admitted. We want to contain, we don't want them to spread. That's why I will highlight the contact tracing that uh, Ministry of Health doing day and night. 20, uh, 20, uh, seven days a week, uh, all, all throughout the Malaysia. Because the contact is, is not only in, in federal territory. They are in Johor, in, in Pulau Pinang, things like that. Lah. So it's important. These two facts, there's no, uh, what do call it, uh, local, uh, what do call it, uh, community infection and no, uh, no sporadic cases will guide Ministry of Health to advise whether general public need to wear masks. I, I went, sorry, I want to make some correction. Yes, the virus, we already isolated the virus. We took the electron micrograph of the virus. We already measured the length of the virus. There's no problem. Yes, the virus is small, but we have to remember that the virus doesn't spread like that. It spread in droplets. Because it's embedded in the droplet, it's bigger. So the mask, three ply mask, actually do help. I guess these are the scientific evidence that uh, do help. But of course, you use uh, 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 N95 much better, lah, but it's not uh, uncomfortable for the public. But of course, must, I agree with Prof, reserved for those who are sick and also those who have uh, comorbid. If you are immunocompromised, you want to go outside, please wear mask. If you want to go to hospital, please wear mask. Otherwise, like, like, situation like this, eh, I don't think that we need to wear masks. Lah because there is no community spread. We have reason why we say so. If we go to the late com uh, 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 containment phase, when there is community spread, then we will advise the public to wear masks. Okay, now I'll give uh, what the public health point of view. I will go first, the screening at the point of entry. Okay, the screening at the point of entry, they have now Malaysia already banned three provinces from China, Hubei, Zhejiang and Jiangsu. These are highly, uh, what do you call it, uh, heavy uh, uh, what do you call it, cases that are being recorded there. So, although China, don't ask me the policy, uh, why the China, uh, Malaysia only banned the Hubei, Zhejiang and Jiangsu. The China national still can come. And uh, because of that, we have strategized our point of entry screening. We have two types of thermal scanner. I mean, two side of the mask scanner. One is at the gate, another one at the arrival hall. Okay, I explain dulu. I explain at the gate first. At the gate meant for China national. When I say China, means that it includes Hong Kong, Macau, and uh, some very sensitive Chinese type. Eh? So we're being uh, asked to go to the gates. And the rest, uh, travelers, we go to the, as usual, they pass through the arrival hall. There is a scanner there. They look at that. Because the, 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 the management will be different. Okay, I start at the gate. If they are, have fever, they will pull out. They will pull out and do the screening at the uh, airport itself. They will ask the clinic. Of course, the thermal scanner will only pick up the temperature. Uh, you have cough, they won't pick up. So this uh, what is screening center at the airport, we ask questions. Lah. The clinical question, cough, running nose, and whatnot. And then, we, the definition I think Prof already gave just now, we have two, two criteria. One is clinical, one is, we call it epidemiological link. The clinical fever or, or eh, not N, sign of acute respiratory infection. Either cough, last time we used to wear pneumonia, now we, we don't care about pneumonia. We know that even some uh, cough also can uh, uh, turn out to be COVID-19. Plus, must have two epidemiological link. One, either the been to China or come in contact with a confirmed COVID-19. If these two fulfill the criteria, uh, and then uh, they will refer to the screening center. This at the screening center. Now I, I explain at the gates, eh? gate, fever, 
uh, their, their, their assess in terms of their clinical symptom and travel history. If they fulfill, then we call we label that person as person under investigation, PUI. Then dedicated ambulance will pick this person, send to the screening center. Why? At the screening center, two events will occur. The first thing, they will swap the patient. Take the oropharyngeal swap. Don't take throat swap. The yield is very minimal. So oropharyngeal, lower better. If you can, I mean, patient in the ward, you will take the lower respiratory, which is the one in the ward. Lah. But outside, the screening center normally at the uh, emergency and trauma departments. Lah. They have a special space for screening center. They will take the swap. Uh, then when they take the swab, they will assess this PUI, so-called PUI, whether they need admission or not. I think Prof already mentioned the five criteria for admission. I won't go into details. Lah. If they don't need admission, this five is not, they not fulfill the criteria for admission, they will send back. They put under order what they call it home surveillance. I will, uh, you can ask me later lah, what is home surveillance. And then 72 hours later, of course they will uh, send back, give what we call a home assessment tool. They got a tool. Huh? Uh, then 72 hours later, uh, our health staff from the district, we pick this PUI, send for the second sample, 72 hours later. If two negative, then uh, we put that on the self surveillance. When they put, when, when I say home surveillance, the, our district, hospital, uh, district health office will get hold of the person, calling them, visit them, make sure their, their, their HIT is not triggered. They, of course, HIT got signs and symptoms, things like that. Lah. Hmm? Okay, that's at the gate if we got fever. Of course, when they admitted, manage as accordingly. Lah. Okay, if they have no fever, this one at the gate, eh, China National, uh, no fever means they are, should be okay, isn't it? But they come from China. We are be worried. We give them hell alert card. We give to the person health alert card. They can go home or they can go to the hotel. Means that if they have developed symptom, they should bring this health alert card. You can look at the health alert card at the, our guidelines. Huh, what it look like, uh, so that the doctor is aware. Let's say they end, end up as IMU. I mean, not all are aware about COVID-19. If somebody come to you with health alert card, mean that you should be aware what to do with the patient. That's at the gate. Okay, another aspect is at the arrival hall. These are the majority of the of the passengers. Uh, and then uh, if they got fever, of course they will pull up because mind you, they may come from uh, say America but if they got fever we pull them. We ask them have you been to China within these 14 days? Because they can be in, uh, from America but five days ago is uh, having business meeting in China, isn't it? That's the reason we pull them up. Uh, if they not, then they not fulfill the PUI. Uh, we give accordingly lah. I mean, it's just fever. It's not fulfilled. It be PCM things like that lah. Some advice, some uh, what call it, uh, uh, what call it, uh, information materials, things like that. If they are not fever, of course they will pass through. Like most of us lah, you just pull the scanner. That's at the uh, point of entry. Okay. Second thing I want to talk about contact tracing. These are very important. Contact tracing, we need a trained personnel. Not everybody can do it. We cannot hire just simply contractor to do it or things like that. And it's labor intensive and time consuming. But it is very important measures in containment of new diseases. If you don't do contact tracing well, then the infection will go into the community, then you have it. A lot of people will end up with the disease. So, Contact tracing is very important, and I mentioned just now, it's seven days a week work, and we have to work outside office hours. And uh, their job is to look, to check the close contact of compound COVID-19. Eh? Uh, the purpose is to ring fencing the virus so that it won't spread to the other persons. Lah. If we know that contact Close contact, I think Prof already uh, defined just now. You can look what we mean by close contact, what we mean by casual contact, because as a, as a contact tracer, we have to differentiate between casual contact and con close contact. Because we don't want to 
unnecessary cast our net too wide. We are spread our resources too thin. And uh, the close contact, uh, if we find a close contact, uh, of course we do the necessary things. Lah. And how we carry out the uh, contact tracing? I think four steps. The first one, interview. Uh, the, the contact tracing, although it sounds like a field work, but it starts at the hospital actually, where we interview the patient. We interview the patients uh, to know their movements and contact of people within 14 days. That start at the hospital to the to the patient that admitted to the confirmed cases. We need the, the data. Otherwise, how you do go around, isn't it? We have to interview the patient at the hospital. Okay, that's quite tedious job. Sometimes patient ill, we ask next of kin things like that. And then following that, we already have a list of uh, contact uh, so-called uh, people come in contact with the case and the event, and then we go into the field. Every district in Malaysia, this district health, district health office, they have a team. We call it Rapid Response Team, RRT. Uh, okay, this Rapid Response Team will be mobilized to the field. Visit each that we already listed as possible contact to the uh, confirmed case to get more details. Huh? Uh, if they are coming uh, contact, how long we have been contact? Because you know casual contact. What we mean by casual contact? All these things need to be trashed out. Nah. If they are, let's say, uh, they are in the restaurants, uh, who serve uh, the waiter? Who uh, we have to identify? Who's the waiter that serve? I mean, uh, let's say Chinese New Year during the Chinese New Year, isn't it? They come in courses. So this waiter should be a close contact because they come to open. But the manager sitting at the counter is not considered as close contact. Uh, so and then. We had to make identification whether that particular person as we consider as close contact and whether it's well or not. Because this will trigger our action. The notification. If the person close contact is well, we will take uh, we will put the person under order under section 342 CDC Act, Amnation CDC Act, order. We put them under home surveillance. But before that, we take the swap. We take the swap and ask them to, under home surveillance, we give them health assessment tool and not, notify the uh, district health office so that they monitor the patient daily. Asymptomatic, meaning the contact is well. So they are under home surveillance. If they are not well, symptom, of course, this one of the criteria for admission, lah, asymptomatic contacts. Uh, then they will uh, put under order also. They will put under hospital isolation. I will explain to you what we mean isolation and quarantine and home surveillance. Because some people use interchangeably between these terminologies. <laughs> and uh, for imported case like China National, the, mo the contact tracing is the moment they landed in Malaysia, where they go? The grab, they take, the hotel, all need to be traced within 14 days. Eh? And of course, contact tracing, the hazard is sometimes our staff being chased by dog. These are the hazard, occupational hazard, uh, uncooperative. Sometimes we need to call the police to do it. To, I mean, we, have to, we main business here. We are protecting the whole nation before spreading of the... Okay. Subsequent thing, I want to talk about triaging. Let me be on triaging. Triaging is conducted at the health centers and also hospital. Hospital normally at the, emergency and trauma department and uh, the site should be well ventilated and appropriate, appropriate PPE should be worn. And uh, the purpose of this triaging, just uh, uh, this one, to look at the symptom, fever, AR, coughing and this thing. Uh. We don't want them to enter our facilities and then uh, by the time they see the doctor, they already spread the disease. So outside the consultation room, Normally, if you go to currently now in hospital project, they stay at the outside. Uh, we ask for the symptom and the travel history. Very important. We, have, we always remember the clinical aspect and the epidemiological link. Uh, if they fulfill the, this one, we get hold of them. This are PUI. Off you go to the screening center, take the swab, and then do the necessary. Lah. Of course, if they are not uh, uh, this one, okay they will go to the normal consultation process. That's a triaging. Yeah? 
Uh, I will talk a little bit about isolation. Isolation occurs in a hospital for sick person suspected PUI. Huh? Uh, suspected PUI. Uh, isolation, I mean those who are familiar with hospital got two, two types. Lah. Normal room and negative pressure room. At the moment, Ministry of Health reserve the negative pressure room for those who are on ventilations. Lah. Okay, uh, they put under order also. They cannot simply run away like Sorry, what happened in Sungai Buloh, they run away, we call the police to catch hold of them, put in them in. So that we, we are very strict about that. Notify, then uh, strict IPC, things like that, lah, isolation. Okay, quarantine. Quarantine by order, by section uh, 15 under CDC Act 342, and meant for asymptomatic of close contact. Asymptomatic, meaning that when you talk about quarantine, patients are well. Uh, this quarantine need to be gazetted by Ministry of Health. You cannot simply quarantine people like MU. It's not gazetted. People can challenge you. It's not quarantine center. Sorry. Okay. Then they have a guards. They have a meal provided. But they have to trade with her. They are not able to go out. For the next 14 days, then even the relative cannot come in. They cannot talk to the relative. I mean, if we have provide some phone, they can talk to the relative. But they cannot come in. They are under... I will say lockdown in the uh, in the specified areas. Hmm? Then uh, from our experience, we have a quarantine center just uh, at the moment. Uh, some of them have developed some depression, so we need to ask our psychiatrists to come in to mental health uh, help. Most of the they they are well, but two of them they are well also, but. Uh, before this uh, uh, Wuhan uh, uh, mission come to Malaysia, they are assessed there in the plane, and when they arrive, we screen, regardless of the symptoms, all of them, once. We screen all of them once. Uh, so that's why we pick up two asymptomatic evacuees. We call it evacuees. Nah? But they are well. They are uh, well in, uh, in Serban. Nah? Okay. Uh, Okay, uh, then we have home surveillance. Home surveillance is downgrade of quarantine. Because if you quarantine uh, people, uh, a lot of costs involved. You need people to guard, uh, you need uh, people to supply the meal. So we step down a bit, home surveillance. But nevertheless, home surveillance is under order, under, under law. You cannot simply uh, go out. You say stay at home. If uh, as much as possible. We will contact you day, uh, in the morning, in the evening. We will visit you. You're not there, then we catch hold of you. Uh, something like that. Then we assess whether they are suitable for home surveillance or not. If they're not suitable, we don't put them on, home, on a home surveillance. Of course, we don't provide meal. They have to uh, cook their own meal. <laughs> uh, but they have home assessment tool. KD, we monitoring them daily for the next 14 days. And then a little bit, I think I take too much time on the screening and complementary being done at the moment by Ministry of Health. Okay, the test that we carry out is uh, a real-time PCR, nah? RT-PCR. Uh, of course, initially uh, when we start the test, uh, we take the positive control from the SARS uh, virus that we grow. Lah. But now we already have uh, what we call real uh, COVID-19. Uh, COVID so we use a positive control. Lah. Okay, for uh, it's not meant to be describe how the PCR being carried out. It's not meant here. But we do the PCR, we culture the virus, and we isolate. Uh, on top of that, we do the electron microscopy. We have two in National Public Health Laboratory. Uh, so the status now, uh, initially only two laboratory can do laboratory confirmation, Institute of Medical Research and National Public Health Laboratory, where I worked before, before I came to Ministry of Health. I was the director of National Public Health Laboratory in Sungai Buloh before. So this two, then we expand to the 12 big government hospital. As for today, we already expand to another five private laboratories. You can check at the government website if you are uh, from the, uh, if you are interested, because you can also simply walk in, you ask the uh, Sungai Buloh doctor to test you, they, they will ask you to go home. Uh, because uh, we are, we have to prioritize. 
with a, uh, whatever limited resources that we have, we are uh, prioritize who going, we're going to test. Of course, as Prom mentioned just now, there are anxious publics want to test. These are the private lab. Of course, you have to spend your own money. Lah. Okay? And uh, what are the current status now? So we already managed to grow the virus, uh, the COVID-19. We already sequenced. So sequenced, we already launched in the gene bank. We already have ascending number. We have three now. NPHR, National Public Laboratory name is already embedded there. Now we are going for full sequencing. So we will send our sample. We cooperate with the Malaysian Genome Institute, MGI. When we send the sample, they said, you open your viral load too small, lah, sikit sangat. So you have to grow some more. So we are, we are growing now. By Monday, we hope that we can get, I think, I, I can't remember, five micrograms, something like that. They need a certain amount of viral load for them to do the full sequencing. We take three days. Lah. Then we have full sequencing. And as I mentioned to Dr. Lokman, we can discuss about the serology. We can develop a lot of things. When we got the full sequencing, the virus, we can do a lot of things. Develop rapid test kit for serology, things like that. Lah. And we already got a picture. We have electron microscope very well. I saw the picture. I will say that the corona, the current corona, COVID-19, looks like corona means uh, Muscovy and SARS. But the, the, the corona, the corona, the radiating, the tentacles, uh, is a bit thicker compared to the, uh, their, their, their family members. Lah. That, that much I can say now. Lah. We already measured the size of things like that. We already done the groundworks. Lah. Okay, uh, on top of that, we all also take serum, serum from the patient. This is not for diagnostic purposes. These are for looking at the prevalence. We help Ministry of Health to change the phase from the uh, containment to the mitigation. If so many people are already exposed, why, why you want to contain? Where's our uh, um, resources, isn't it? So this our, we, 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 we took the sample, but we keep it. And we also took a rectal swab. Maybe you ask why you need a rectal swab? Because one of the symptoms is rare, uh, is diarrhea. But uh, I think people also must wear, I mean especially clinician, the lopinibir and rotinibir, the combination drug, uh, Calistra, the main side effect is also diarrhea. So, so far our rectal swab are negative. Okay, okay. Uh, the the PCR can be carried out at the BSL-2. Of course, the culture, you need BSL-3, which is none of the private lab have the BSL-3. I think i uh, stop for now. You can ask questions later. Thank you very much. So, who would know that so much was going on? Well, yeah. So we're so glad we're here today. We've got so much insights into what's going on in the ground. And we're really so grateful to the government for doing the best to protect us. So now we will have uh, Dr. Lokman sharing his experiences, lessons, experiences learned from the past. So uh, this is deja vu time. <laughs> so I think uh, this is important for us as well. Dr. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Ku. Yeah, my job here to, to reassure you that we are well. Trust me, we are well. The country is well. We are in good hands. No, the, the first thing that struck me when, when the, the China reported the, the occurrence of this uh, novel virus is the spread of this particular virus. No, like any other previous novel infection, uh, these viruses was were rapidly spread through air travel. People don't take camels or caravan anymore. We're moving around. So I'm just wondering, what is the air traffic like? I mean, to, to give an estimate, what is the risk of any country to import the virus? I think to me, this is the first risk assessment that we, uh, every country should be doing. And sure enough, within just within one week of the reported cases, a group of uh, epidemiologists from Canada came out with this work. Oops, sorry. They look at the data of air travel from IATA 
the previous year and match it, I mean, and, and estimate the number of, move, of people moving out of China during this same period last year, in between January to February. And they came, came out with this map. And the size of the circle actually reflects the load of the, 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 the passengers, the travelers' load to each of the country. And from here, for example, it's very obvious that Singapore is going to have a lot of problems compared to Malaysia. You just look at the size of the circle. So do you expect, I mean, they are very different from us? Of course. The risk, they are having a bigger risk than us. Right? And that is reflected, in fact, by the numbers of cases being reported. Right? Now, are we done with this outbreak? Are we already reaching the peak? I mean, I'm, I'm sure you have been receiving lots of information about where we are. I've been monitoring this too. The last two days I was very comfortable because I thought it's already showing signs of, of plateauing, meaning the number of new cases are reducing in the epic center itself in China. But this morning I was scared by <laughs> looking at this, the same source of information, a sudden charm of, of number of cases. What's happening? And this world is very flourish with conspiracy theories. They believe lots of things. Well, the, but this is a true thing. These are the number of new cases being reported. But the information that I got is that there's a changing definition of the infection. So when you change the definition, things will change. I was told that the, the definition is now very liberal. You don't need any laboratory testing. It's more of a clinical diagnosis. Uh, that's why the jump in number of cases. But what comforting me is the fact that the number of cases outside China. So if you have any doubt with what Chinese government is doing, that you might say that they are they're hiding cases, they are not telling the truth. But the number of cases outside China remains stable. Of the three, four hundred cases, only one person died outside China. Meaning, to me, the virus is not very fatal, as what Prof. Chim was saying. But of course, it looks very more, much more infectious than SARS, but it is very much less fatal. Of course, in China, it's different because it is the epicenter of everything. Millions of, uh, hundreds and thousands of people have been exposed. But the fatality rate is low, less than 3%. Right? And even the graph by WHO, in fact, did show a slowing down of the number of new cases. So to me, there's a window of opportunity there. No. First, because China did something unprecedented in the history of managing outbreak like this. Never in, any his, in, in, in anywhere in the world that they quarantined the entire cities. Never. You might say this is a, 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 a cruelty to humanity, but looking at the risk to the general population at large, including global community, they did that. And we must be thankful to China because of doing that. Otherwise, you just imagine with the number of load of patients traveling out from China, what do you think is going to be the picture of uh, COVID now. Very different. I'm sure it could be very different. All right? Outside, as I said, outside China, the progression is very slow. Number of cases increases by one or two. Remember during H1N1. The number of cases of once community spread goes, it goes up in hundreds. I will sh show you the graph of what we used to have in each one of them before. And of course, oops, sorry. <laughs> because it is not as infectious as influenza, it gives us time. It allows us the time for scientists to start developing 
the vaccine. This is very important because if the, patient, the infection is very is fatal, we need something to to, to, to protect not uh, to protect the general population who are not exposed. Vaccine is a very important tool in this uh, in, uh, public health intervention in this, and of course also in terms of drug development uh, to treat those patients being infected. During H1N1, just within four weeks of the introduction, the importation of the first case to the country, the number of cases increases in the hundreds and thousands, during, just within the short spell of six months. That's how H1N1 was. So when the number of reported cases been, uh, that the ministry is reporting about this COVID, I see it's nothing. It's nothing. Right? Now, so what should we do? I say, leave it to the expert. Right? Unfortunately, when a situation a crisis like this, there are so many experts around giving expert opinions. But this is the reality. Now, we have I must tell you, I was there for six years as the commanding general of public health in managing this kind of outbreak. Six years. Four different novel infections, I was there as a commanding officer. Two infections, I was the lieutenant general. Because prior to that, I was in Aima investigating and helping in the, in, the, the, in the investigation of Nepal virus and SARS. But I managed a 7 and 1. We imported a 7 and 1, but we stopped it from spreading. That's why you don't hear anything about a 7 and 1. We imported Muscovy. You just imagine, Muscovy is from in Middle East. Muslims are going to the Saudis in hundreds every year. In fact, in a month, the risk to our militia of acquiring the infection is very high. And we have imported one case, positive case, but we managed to, to, to stop it from spreading to other, to other uh, people. We have several episodes of H5N1 among the chickens, not human. And Malaysia has been able to keep human free of H5N1. This is zoonotic infection. The virus can just jump from chicken to human. But every time a case or a reported case of avian influenza happening in our chicken, we mobilize our team. Both the veterinary and Ministry of Health works together to manage the problem. And until today, for record, we have never had any H5, H5N1. So that, all this, we learned a lot from SARS. We learned a bitter uh, experience with Nipah. Hundreds of people dying from this infection. At that time, I remember, we can't even diagnose Nipah. We don't even have electron microscope, functioning electron microscope at that time. I was in the IMR, struggling. I would, I would only transmission microscope was down. We checked another university that have electron microscope at that time, UPM is also down. And we scrambled to get the, these two machines working, working out. And after one month, we managed to, to get it doing functioning. Then there was hints that tell us we are not dealing with JE. Remember it was during the first episode, we were spraying mosquito spray because we thought that was a JE and because the mosquito had carried it. And we learned a bitter lesson from that. And because of that experience, we put up, the ministry put up papers to enhance and strengthen laboratory capacities and also our field epidemiologists. And I think what, what we, uh, we have achieved so far is because of all this learning experience. Right? Now, even our expert, our Ministry of Health expert, 
has been sent by WHO to manage other more difficult infections like Ebola. In 2016, I sent three of our field epidemiologists from the Ministry of Health to Sierra Leone to help WHO to manage. Nobody wants to go to Sierra Leone at that time. But I told my officer, no, I'm the general, you go. <laughs> I cannot go because WHO doesn't simply allow anyone to go, even though you want to offer your service. You must be a trained personnel in this field. And we have the people trained in our ministry. And that's why when we offer ourselves to help, WHO never blink the eyes. Malaysia, go. That is the level of confidence we are talking about in our system. And I'm not surprised when WHO continued to comment on our effort. When we, during H1N1, the WHO DG herself commented on our, our effort in H1N1. And now, even our country reps, WHO country reps, so no I mean, shows her confidence in the system that we, we have in the country. We are, very, we are good in many things, actually. This country, in terms of infectious diseases, I tell you, we are very good. IMR is already 140 years among, among the pre premier tropical this, this, this research institute in the world. IMR was established together with London School. Even for this particular virus, IMR people have already developed the protocol a week earlier than WHO. Once China released the whole genome, our IMR scientists already working on the protocol. So when WHO published the protocol, then we look at our protocol, it's the same. We are, we are already ready to, do the, to, to run the test at that point in time. So of course, in disaster uh, events like this, there's always been a fallout, economic fallout, of course. There's already thousands, thousands of flights being cancelled, hotel booking being dropped. This is something that's going to happen. But what should the government do? Should we stop tourists? Should we stop travellers? Because it's going to cost. I tell you, public, decision, public health policy, this policy decision is not easy. It's a very complex process. It's a very complex process. I was there, I know how complex is it. We cannot be doing making public decision, public policy decision based on emotion. It's terrible. It must be based on science and evidence. And that's what I think the MOH until today are very steadfast. When the government say no, we are only going to close the, those three cities in China, there's those three cities. We have reason for that. I'm sure they have the reason for that. Why we are not closing our border to Singapore? We know we have the reasons for that. So just leave it to the expert to decide, to advise the government what to do. We have enough experts in this country to advise. And they are not just depending on, on the Ministry of Health officers. There are people from the academic are also helping in the process of advising the government. So I, 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 like, I, I follow most of the time the press statement made by, uh, by the ministers and it usually goes live streaming, right? And you, you, sometimes you look at the comments by the netizen. Uh, this is how a Malaysian behave. Uh. When people are trying to say what Dr. Kebe was saying, uh, how difficult to do contact tracing. The man hour that have been put the, the, the diligence in determining that every contact is being identified and traced. And people are saying that we, our contact tracing has been excellent, then somebody say, oh, we are overconfident. <laughs> then how can you make sure those who not close contact will not be infected? Nobody is sure. <laughs> if you are not in contact, how sure you are not, you're not infected? I mean, nobody knows. Lah. I mean, like this. If you can't think simple logic like that, how can you get infection if you are not in contact of the infection, infected person? All right. 
So, as far as WHO is concerned, with regard to uh, uh, virus sharing and what's not, we have a network of laboratories at international level. The, there are more than 150 laboratories throughout the world that contribute toward sharing of the viruses. It's very important in the process of sharing of the viruses because uh, in order to develop the vaccine or the drug, we need this information. And it takes some time, and especially with virus, because of the, ten the, the, the capability of changing its genetic uh, constituent, that makes life more difficult. So we need as many viruses as possible throughout the world. So every country that uh, have, uh, have the opportunity to collect the virus will then share these viruses through, us, through the WHO network. So that a panel of experts can then decide the type of vaccine that can be produced. Because of this good cooperation, we, can, we are confident that, for example, the scientists are very confident that the vaccine can be come up within the next 18 months. Of course, you say 18 months or so, one and a half years, very long. But imagine the, the time required to develop a drug, it takes 10 years. So what is there in 18 months? So if, this, for example, this infection goes out of control through the community spread, then at least we have the opportunity of having the vaccine soon with us. I think I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dato. Um, that was very, very insightful. Um, I just want to say that I think we have a lot of reasons to be grateful that we've been really reassured. Um, I've not heard this before today, so this is not a propaganda. I'm feeling very grateful for what uh, you know, the experts are sharing with us. I feel very reassured, but I'm sure there are also some questions that you would like to uh, uh, ask the experts. If you have any questions, we will probably do in the next five minutes because I think time is running out. Any burning questions, just put up your hands. We have people running to you. Or you can type your questions in. Yeah, there are already questions. Okay. Which one? Okay. Uh, somebody says, this may look like an immigration question, but it's relevant with MOH, Ministry of Health, and our policy as a whole. What happened to the PRC nationals now in Malaysia with expiring stay? Chase them back or extend? Uh, does somebody want to say? <laughs> okay, uh, I won't touch on policy, you know, This uh, because I was informed these are recorded sessions. <laughs> okay, okay. As for the PRC national that in Malaysia, we must be realistic. Huh? Uh, I mentioned just now, we the person becomes suspect because of two reasons. The clinical criteria plus the epidemiological link. If for whatever reason the PRC and PRC National in Malaysia they fulfill the, these two criteria, we pull them up as PUI. Otherwise, they can do whatever normally they do. That's my answer. There's no reason to send a PRC National that reside. Per, uh, PR status in Malaysia. There's no reason. Even there's no reason not to mingle with them, unless they got friend from Wuhan stay at their home. Lah. Then we are be worried. Lah. That's a different story altogether because we know that uh, they got what they call it uh, incubation period. People may pass through our thermal scanner. They are well, but uh, if they are from Wuhan, we will. I, I I mentioned to you just now. We catch hold. Although they know fever, we give them health alert card. For 14 days, we want, we want to know whether they develop symptoms or not. After 14 days, based on the current knowledge, the incubation period is 14 days. I think Prom mentioned about 24 days. I want just to make a little bit comment, if I may. If you look at the study 24 days, as for us epidemiologists, we don't, I won't say trust the study, because the incubation period, they include the zero. How come the, the respiratory infection start from zero? So the paper is not properly, I mean, the, pay, the, the subject not properly screened, uh, what I call it, clean, before they make a conclusion. You cannot start from zero, isn't it? At least 48 hours for the virus to replicate to show symptoms. They got another paper 
by Euro surveillance, I don't bring here, then that's a better study. If you go uh, because they give a better, uh, what do you call it, perspective in terms of incubation period. The one that mentioned up to 24 days, for us epidemiology, we reject because it includes zero as zero to 24. How can you got zero? Because the virus need time to replicate. Sorry. Thank you. So, thank you, uh, Dr. Kabir. I think it's important how we are reading the reports. So we are here, we're very lucky today that we're actually hearing from the experts directly. There's one question uh, on, uh, on uh, if there should be a community break, should I, uh, a breakout, should I bring my kids to the swimming pool? Is that advisable? It's not bullying. Eh? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. These are, I would say, hypothetical questions. As for now, I must say that the situation is evolving very fast. We can say as for now. As for now, I mentioned, I've been repeatedly mentioned, there's no community spread. There's no reason to not to hold gathering, uh, you uh, have a go to swimming pool, things like that. But, if we go to the stage, but eh, if, if, big if, you may stop like, uh, what do you call it, like SARS. After a while, it just died off. Or it can be like uh, H1N1. It dragged on and then it becomes lost in virulency. It spread to the community, but it becomes a seasonal influenza. It can be like that also. There are a lot of uh, paths that this particular COVID-19 can follow. If, if it's very fatal, then it stops there. Because it kills most of the people, isn't it? But if less fatal, infectious, then I will say they follow the H and H1N1 pathway. They spread to the community. After a while, a lot of people being infected. Because we know that from the statistic, 70,000 uh, studies by WHO, 83% are mild. Only, uh, ma uh, only 15 severe, uh, uh, moderate, and only 3% are severe. So a lot of my cases. This possibly spread to the community. Lah. And as I said just now, it's a hypothetical question. When we come to the stage, we may, at that particular time, depend on the lot of factors, we may advise the public accordingly. But I don't want to advise, to give advice now. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. I just to want us to, to support that last statement by Dr. Kabir, that's normally is the process. Uh, um, before any advisory being given out, we will need to understand about the behavior of this particular virus, how it's been transmitted, what are this mode of transmission, and what, how the clinical presentation, and what's not the severity of the infection, and what's all. From then, then the, the, the Ministry of Health will deduce a specific guideline, guideline on, on, on for the public when we reach that level. Like Singapore, for example, they have this uh, green, orange, uh, uh, red stage. I think the Ministry of Health also. In, Maybe in the process of, uh, I'm not sure, because uh, they have not announced anything yet. But normally during our time, I mean, that was the process. We have graded our, the, the, the level of, 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 of public uh, 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 emergencies in that sense, so that they can be guided of what needs to be done and, or what, uh, what not to be, to be done. So maybe, I don't know. I mean, the, if you want to Just to add a bit what Prof. Uh, Dato Lokman said. As far as Ministry of Health concerned, we are colorblind. <laughs> I mean, we don't issue any color. We divide our strategies into four phases. Alert, of course, we have to need to prepare, get the information, uh, networking. Then, containment phase. Containment phase means we have early and late. Of course, still we try to contain. If we have not sustained uh, community infection, we still try to contain. We stop my gathering at that particular time. And then we feel that they're already up in the community. We we go to mitigations no? and recovery phase. What I want to mention just now, I forgot. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, we don't have. Don't wait for the color to come up from our press. I mean, as as for now, lah. I don't know in the future. Thank you. Uh, it's very reassuring. We have one more question uh, from a mother. I have a kid that has chronic bronchiectasis, which is a, a lung problem. What is your recommendation to protect him? We'll ask our... Um, um, a, a child with bronchiectasis, I'm not sure what is the um, 
original cause that because bronchitis is actually a complication of an initial um, infection or assault of the lung. So uh, people with bronchitis tend to be more prone to infections. So they they are compared to a normal child. Um, not saying the child is not normal, but compared to a child whose he lungs are healthy, they are probably more prone for infections. Um, I think the same same step still still applies. Uh, um, I, I I would not recommend uh, us to to you know be over uh, or panicky or anything. We just follow the same advisory. But uh, in terms, if you are bringing your child to a crowded area and uh, which you are not unsure whether they will be more at risk of. Uh, 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 being exposed to an infection, then I would recommend your child to uh, to wear a mask, right? And um, but then you know we children. I'm not sure how old is this child, but children also quite hard for them to keep the mask on. So it might be a bit difficult. So if 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 the trip is absolutely essential, then yes, go ahead. But if not, then I would ref prefer not to bring. If it's my child, I would not bring to a crowded area uh, where the risk would be higher. Other than that is the usual wash hands. I'm crazy about washing hands. That's my children. It's always wash hands. Did you wash with soap? Yes. Okay. So that's a daddy kind of advice. Um, so I would advise that as well, right? And if you don't have access to soap and water, then a good old alcohol uh, hand rub is, is probably adequate as well. Thank you, Prof. Okay. Sure. Okay. The, I mentioned just now, at the moment, only two categories of person that we advise to wear mask. The first one, of course, the sick person. Sick means you got influenza, so you should wear mask. Lah. Okay, the other category is this one, the unwell. I mean, immunocompromised, have comorbidities, pregnant lady, extreme ages, things like that, wear mask. Okay, if possible, like Prof mentioned just now, don't go to crowded places. If you have to go to crowded places, wear mask. If we wear mask, then another aspect is we wear mask alone. Of course, you need a proper wearing of mask with proper fit in. Don't touch, simply touch. Don't dispose properly. Another aspect is personal hygiene, hand washing. Why? If you go to the crowded places, we identify what we call it high touch area. You know what I mean by high touch area? The railings, eh? uh, the door knobs. Eh? If possible, don't touch the high touch area. But you cannot enter the, the room without uh, pulling the knob, isn't it? If you have to, uh, for whatever reason, you have to contact, come into contact into the high touch area, then wash your hand. But sometimes you don't bring your sanitizer. You don't have a facility to wash your hand. What next you advise the, uh, the person? Don't bring your hand up to, from neck up. Don't rub your eyes. Don't uh, pick your nose. Don't put your something in your mouth until you get a facility to wash your hand that our advice nah? uh, for those who are need to be cautious as for 18 k uh, 19 cases i just want to highlight I, I forgot to mention their condition we have 19 cases for everybody information we have managed uh, three discharges we discharge well three patients now we have uh, 19 minus 3, we have 16. All are considered mild. But some moderate on a lopinibe, it's combination of lopinibe and rotinibe. It's an uh, antiviral drug. But uh, very, very, very few patients. So all are mild. Uh, we think that we can pull through. But we can, nev we can never predict what happened tomorrow or the next week. So these are very fast evolving uh, situations. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you so much. We are really so full of information now and I'm, I'm sure a lot of us are very reassured. I'm trying to touch my specs but be very mindful. <laughs> yeah, I think for in the interest of time, we just do one last question. Uh, somebody has asked, if somebody has been discharged and found negative and discharged, will that person become positive again? This is our last question. Anybody who wants to answer? Okay, if somebody, let's say the three cases that you already discharged, I think a Prof mentioned just now the discharge criteria. Of course, they have to be well. Symptomatically, they have to be very well. But before we discharge, we make sure we have two consecutive negative PCR. 
24 hours apart. 24 hours apart. So, as you, we all know that when the virus or bacteria enter the body, we fall sick, our body try to fight back. We develop antibody, some fighting mechanism lah, to clear the, the virus. So, they are well. They are discharged well. They can, uh, but if they not completed the 14 days, we still put them under safe. We don't uh, get hold of them. We put them under safe monitoring within, uh, with health, uh, health assessment tool. But can they get infected again? Of course. If their immunity getting low after a while, we don't know. Uh, like some viral infection, the immunity like, uh, uh, immunity like you either got artificial, artificial by vaccination, what Dr. Lokman mentioned, or you got natural uh, jab, isn't it? The virus come into your body, you got developed immunity. So we don't know at the moment how long the antibody lasts in the in the in the in our body. Lah. So theoretically speaking, if the antibody getting low, so they can get better, but the chances not immediately. Lah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. We will bring this to a close. We like to uh, thank our experts.